Hello and welcome to everyone once again, wherever you are in the world. As we know from previous experience, we have uh, many people coming in from various countries um, across the world. So welcome to each and every one of you as well. This is the fifth of the series of six uh, fire risk management lunchtime back to basics webinars. And having covered the science of fire, the fire prevention, fire precautions, and investigations, we now move on to the topic of designing for fire safety. Now, don't forget that if you missed any of the previous webinars, you can see them uh, just by going to the link, which is now in the chat box, um, and they're all on YouTube. So uh, if you want to go back and look at them, or indeed, if you want to watch all of them together, um, then please do so. So if you're new to the sessions, uh, my name is Neil Vincer and I'm the chair of the IOSH Fire Risk Management Group. And it's once again my pleasure to introduce Michelle Pitkin, um, who is my vice chair, Ian Scott, um, who's one of my committee members, and he'll be joining us actually later for the question and answer session. And today we welcome to Michael Woods, who's another committee member, um, and he will be leading the webinar today. So we'll hear more and see more from, uh, from Michael as we go through. So as a reminder, many of the webinars that we've seen over the past 18 months or so have centered around subjects that are of interest to the more experienced occupational safety and health or fire professional. However, many of the comments or questions that we've received have come from the less experienced practitioner. So either the younger members who are just starting out in their OSH role, or others that may have transitioned from another role into OSH. And we know there's many of you in that situation. This series, therefore, uh, is therefore based and aimed primarily at those who are less experienced in the field. But we hope that they will also act as a reminder to those who have been in the role much longer. So feedback from the previous sessions has clearly ended, uh, indicated that this is the case. So if you have any questions, and certainly, again, we would expect to see some, or you need any clarification about what Michael says, um, then please put those questions to us by using the question and answer um, button that's on the screen in front of you. We will try to answer as many as we can during the webinar, but again, we know that we will probably get a large number and we won't be able to cover all of them. But as in all previous cases, actually, we will take any questions we get, we will answer them, we will make them available via our website um, and you can get to them um, from there. So watch out for the links that will follow following them, the, uh, the webinar today. Now, one point about questions and answers is Michael will be referring to the Grenfell um, incident um, that occurred, the fire that happened in London. Now, in this case, please um, be aware that we cannot answer all questions that you're likely to put to us around Grenfell. It would be sub judice because there is ongoing uh, investigations and potential um, uh, legal outcomes, which we cannot um, and will not get involved in. And so, so if you can limit your questions to other things other uh, than Grenfell, we would be grateful because uh, we don't like to say no. So let's move on to our presenter. To our presenter today, as I said, is Michael Woods. And Michael has, has over 40 years experience in industry. And he's worked for a number of different companies, such as the Electricity Supply Board, London Transport Executive, Xerox, and Intel. He actually retired at the end of 2019, having spent his later working years as a facilities officer at Dublin City University. And for those of you who don't know much about it, it's actually a very large 50 acre site and it has something like 46 plus buildings on it as well. So he had an awful lot to cover and obviously he'll use that experience and things that he's gained from it as well. Now he actually gained experience of fire engineering, which is why he's in uh, the committee as he is now. Um, whilst working for Mather and Platt, and that was offshore in the North Sea. And again, 
he's used that experience while he's actually been serving on the Frega, our fire risk management group. And indeed also on the IOSH um, Ireland fire risk management section of which actually he actually is the representative on the fire risk management group. And indeed he covers the IOSH Ireland branch group as well. So you can see he's a very active person and we're very glad that he's actually with us today. So I think it's time now that I handed it over to Michael uh, and I hope actually you enjoy, um, I'm sure you will do, um, Michael's presentation to us today. So Michael, it's all over to you. Yes, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna share my screen now and um, let's get started into this. Uh, sorry. Hello, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this webinar on designing for fire safety. Thank you, Neil, for the lovely introduction. Um, as Neil has said, this is the fifth uh, webinar in a series of modern fire safety pre uh, presentations. Uh, and as he mentioned, the first four already uh, that you can review if you need, uh, we're on the science and chemistry of fire, fire prevention, fire precautions, and fire investigation. As Neil has introduced me, uh, I am a volunteer member of Irish Fire Risk Management Group and a committee member on the Ireland branch, treasurer of the Fire Risk Management Section Ireland, and I am a chartered member of Irish. As a facilities manager at Dublin City University, uh, I was involved in uh, delivering, in the process of delivering, many new buildings over a 20 year timeline. Uh, and during that time, I managed hundreds of minor works and projects uh, at the university as a member uh, of the university estates management team. If you are new to the construction sector and the building control process, a useful guide is the manual to the building regulations. It's a code of practice and it's available on the web and free to download. We will discuss some of these regulations later in the presentation. So I'll move on uh, to my first slide. Today is the 10th of February and around the world, many are probably thinking of St. Valentine's Day and, uh, which is next Monday, and how they're going to celebrate it. 41 years ago in Artane, Dublin, the Stardust nightclub fire left 48 young people dead and 214 were injured. Over 800 people were there on the night of February the 14th, 1981, to enjoy a disco dancing competition. Fire broke out, the lights failed, and panic ensued as the patrons trying to escape discovered that a number of emergency doors were chained or padlocked. The Stardust scandal has always boiled down to two questions. How did the fire begin? And how much responsibility do nightclub owners bear? It's taken until September 2019 for a fresh inquest into the deaths, which is what was ordered uh, by the then Attorney General, Seamus Wolfe but they haven't started yet. Following delay after delay, let's hope that in 2022, the families of the victims and the survivors will get a fair and just outcome to this horrific event in 1981. In the words of Nelson Mandela, it's never too late to do the right thing. On the 14th of June, 2017, a fire broke out in the Grenfell Tower block of flats in North London, Kensington. 72 people died, including two who later died in hospital. More than 70 others were injured and 223 people escaped. Within two years of that date, a coroner's inquest had been completed. The Commons Select Committee, co committee hearing on the disaster was completed. The first phase of a two-phase inquiry was completed, and the second and final phase of the inquiry is underway, despite delays 
as a result of COVID-19. Both the Stardust and Grenfell fires were foreseeable and preventable. You may very well have other fire events in mind, and today we will look at how we are designing for fire safety to help prevent reoccurrences. As you read down through this definition, D4FS looks at not only CDM type design issues, but process design and process safety in operations and ergonomics in the way work is undertaken safely with fire safety in mind. The management of fire risk is a vital responsibility for anyone in charge of a building or portfolio of buildings. This is especially the case for infrastructure that is high risk, such as hospitals and care homes. This is a really important slide and depicts the elements of designing for fire safety. As you can see, it includes a wide range of areas to be considered. In previous presentations in this series, we have looked at some in detail, and today we will take a look at some of the other areas. Of course, you don't have to address all these issues at once, and you may, in a small project with well-defined fire risks, think that some of the aspects are unnecessary. But I bet at some stage in your career, you will encounter them all. To address these issues today, this presentation is essentially divided into two parts. The first part looks at what could be called the CDM or construction issues. They are the aspects and impacts of good design for fire safety on the building and its construction process. The second part focuses on how we successfully manage that process and manage the finished or operational building to manage the residual fire risks. This is the integrated approach. Starting with the construction process, the CDM regulations apply with newer buildings from design and construction phase through the timeline of the construction of the building to the facilities management phase. The design of any new building is required to include a detailed fire strategy for the protection of building occupants and property. Key factors here are building use and complexity of design, as well as variations from standard buildings detailed in the regulations. During construction, the tier one contractor takes on responsibility for delivery of the design, including passive fire protection elements. Subcontractors are often expected to make sure that their work meets passive fire protection requirements. It is common for this to be included across several packages of work, as opposed to being one package in its own right. Key risk factors to keep in mind are sleeping risks and type of occupancy, specific purpose groups of buildings, the presence of sprinklers, height of top story above ground, depth of lowest basement below ground, The occupier of a building is typically responsible for fire safety of its occupants. In hospitals, this is usually the NHS, and in schools, it's typically the local authority that holds responsibility. The responsible person is required to carry out fire risk assessments regularly, recognize and understand risks already identified. Also, they must maintain appropriate fire safety measures and make plans for emergencies. This key information must be communicated in an appropriate manner to all building occupants and include training where necessary. With old buildings, the obligation to maintain safety systems and ensure operational plans, including evacuation plans, which must be up to date, sits with the building occupiers and facilities managers. 
typically facilities managers, the FM, holds duties and assume responsibility for compliance with fire safety requirements. Any work's been carried out to maintain the building or to alter the building or its services in any way should take the fire strategy into account. It's essential the integrity of fire systems, including passive fire protection, should be protected. A permit to work stroke hot work system in place and engaging a competent contractor will assist the FM when undertaking such works. Plant rooms are normally restricted areas and potential, potentially uh, contain lots of hazards. The risk of fire within boiler rooms are a particular concern and it is essential that adequate, adequate control measures are in place. Boiler stroke plant rooms are provided to house essential mechanical and electrical equipment, including air conditioning, electrical distribution, switchgear, pumps, water treatment, boilers, etc., to manage your building requirements. Therefore, there may be hazards associated with fire or explosion, electricity, tree phase, distribution boards and switchgear, earthing, lightning arresters. Asbestos, especially in older buildings, fumes and gases, contact with multi-fuels, oil leaks, gas safety, etc. Pressure vessels, confined space entry, that's just to name a few. These areas must not be used for storage or any other purpose. Good housekeeping procedures must be in place. So when filter changes are taking place on the AHUs, that's the air handling units, ensure the contractor removes all the old filters on the day. You may also want to check the permit to work system is in place to be mindful of multiple contractors working in the same area. Loan working procedures are in place for daily routines, such as readings and inspections, lift inspections, etc. And that clear escape routes are maintained at all times. As insurers, Zurich promotes the importance of recognizing the benefits of protecting properties with holistic fire prevention strategies. That way, if any incident did occur, the impacts are likely to be reduced. Furthermore, buildings can be made more resilient by incorporating property protection objectives, such as constructing the building with materials that incorporate non-combustible construction that will resist the fire, not add to the fire load, and remain structurally sound after a fire. Providing compartmentation features to confine or limit fire spread within a building. Installing suppression systems such as sprinklers. D4FS is ever-changing and facing new challenges. We are seeing a rise in innovation in the construction sector, including the rise of modern methods of construction MMC. The selection and choice of materials is heavily influenced on making buildings safe and the non combustibility, because the non combustibility of construction products, materials, and construction methods. Most homes in the UK today were built using a traditional brick and block approach to the construction. However, alternative methods that depart from this approach are becoming increasingly common, particularly in the construction of social housing. Note the government targets in 2019 set at 300,000 new homes built every year by the mid 2020s. The focus now is on modern methods of construction, MMC. Effectively, MMC describes an approach to constructing buildings more quickly, reliably, and sustainability with, by methods such as off-site manufacturing, such as modular construction panels with timber or light steel framing, 
structural insulated panels or cross laminated timber. This includes ready-made walls, floors, roofs, and entire rooms, which can be transported to the end destination for assembly, often in a matter of hours. MMC is a collective term to describe these alternative construction practices. This list was originally inspired by government policy to achieve targets in addressing the housing shortage, as mentioned earlier, and the agenda around better homes for more people. The original list of topics did not have any occupational safety factors and were all business focused. I have added the safety factors as number one on the list, where I hope we would all agree that is where it should be. As you examine this photograph from Sweden, let's look at the risks and real and perceived disadvantages of MMC. Key risks comprise of fire safety with timber frames, particularly during the construction phase, robustness of the building in a fire, life safety versus property protection for firefighters, limiting fire spread and protecting adjacent buildings. Response of materials in fire due to value engineering and product substitution. Repair and replacement challenges with modular construction and product obsolescence. Wood and timber construction features heavily in design. Note, also the construction quality issues brought about by value engineering and product substitution. Usually an initiative to reduce the cost of construction, with also a complementary reduction in value. There is nothing wrong here with these approaches, if that is the construction strategy. But as always, risk must be well managed. Fire resistance versus fire resilience. Fire resistance is how well a material withstands burning. Fire resilience refers to the ability of the building material to continue functioning after the fire has stopped. So note, modular construction introduces a new element of risk as components have to be moved on site and brought together in a way that does not compromise the building's performance or resilience from a fire perspective. There are also concerns as how the factory standards associated with many of the off-site construction can be maintained during the on-site elements of that construction. For example, potential weaknesses and breaches in fire separation and fire compartmentation. As mentioned earlier, Zurich is campaigning for minimum standards in new buildings to increase their resilience to fire. If we fail to put resilience front and center when thinking about sustainability, the risks go far beyond the potential loss of a property. To briefly summarize then, D4FS in construction is about designing for fire safety during the construction process in occupation, living, working, learning, and making people feel better within the building spaces they occupy. We take note that good design is about good engineering and safety in construction, safety in operation, safety and maintenance of the building, minimum lifetime harm to the occupants, and a whole life approach to the building, its sustainability and the environment. The second half of this presentation focuses on how we successfully manage the process and manage the finish or occup occupational uh, time of the building to manage the fire residual risks. As said earlier, this is an integrated approach. As you read the definition, in the next five slides, we will look at the elements of a fire risk management system. It can be put in place to design, 
manage, plan, and coordinate appropriate fire safety procedures. It should clearly document how an organization will achieve those objects, objectives and manage fire risks. British Standard BS 9997 2019 was released in August 2019 and supersedes the previous FRMS PAS 7 2013. It is designed to provide a framework for organizations of all sizes to manage their approach to fire risk in a holistic risk-based way, applying the widely recognized plan, do, check, act, test cycle. The graphic illustrates key issues. Virtually all of the material could be written within an organization or could be prepared in-house. There are excellent sources of guidance available from the HSE and other professional bodies. Reference to this source of material is given in the IOSH Fire Risk Management Group publications. On the left-hand side of the slide are the statutory requirements of the ORO. The requirements listed are detailed in the accompanying notes of this presentation. Wherever you are in the world, I assume that the same duties of care and content will apply as detailed in these documents. This is now becoming a fairly standardized industry stroke commercial process in our fire safety sector. As you read through the definition, be mindful that there is a world of difference between a fire hazard spotting exercise and a fire risk assessment. As suggested in the definition, the key elements are in the downstream attitude of the fire risk assessment. In the middle of this slide is an image of one of the excellent UK gov.uk publications on fire risk assessments in educational premises. This guide is divided into two parts. Part one explains what fire risk assessment is and how you might go about it. Fire risk assessments should be the foundation for all the fire precautions in your premises. Part two provides further guidance on fire precautions. The information is provided for you and others to dip into during your fire risk assessment or when you are reviewing your precautions currently in place. The appendices provide example checklists, some detailed technical information on fire resisting elements and advice on historic buildings. All businesses must have a fire risk assessment. It is the cornerstone of fire protection along with the fire safety logbook. The fire risk assessment is a coordinated review at what in your work activities and work environment could cause harm to people. In the case of a fire, it is identifying possible causes of fire. And there are five key elements to be considered when undertaking a fire risk assessment. The key elements comprise of identify fire hazards, identify people at risk, evaluate, remove, reduce, and protect from risk. Record, plan, inform, instruct, and train. And of course, always, always review. You can see references to all these aspects of safety legislation and guidance as published by the Irish Fire Risk Management Group on the Fire Risk Management Group portal. The key issue here is that in designing for fire safety, it is not just the principal legislation and guidance that we should be following, but it is being aware of all the very important peripheral legislation and guidance. It's vital to have access to a database where all current legislation documentation is available, have a robust fire 
risk management system, and an electronic document management system, an EDMS, and a risk register. Please note, standards aren't the same as regulations, and following a standard doesn't guarantee that you are in you are within the relevant laws. Standards rarely cite the law, as legislation could change within the lifetime of the standard. However, the government often draws on standards when putting together legislation or guidance documents. This is a huge subject and needs dedicated resources. This piece of legislation comprises essentially of duties and enforcement supported by a series of detailed articles. The regulatory reform fire safety order 2005, the RRO, amends or replaces 118 pieces of legislation, the most significant being the repeal of the Fire Precautions Act 1971 and the cancellation of the Fire Precautions Workplace Regulations 1997. Note, Schedule 2 of the RRO, it's up to date with all changes known to be in force on or before the 12th of January 2022. There are changes that may be brought into force at a future date. Changes that have been made appear in the content and are referenced with annotations. Dealing with the detail, there are six key tenets of the order, which form the structure of the legislation. These key tenets are fire risk assessments, fire extinguishers, fire safety signs, fire alarm systems, emergency lighting, fire safety training. All these headings have been discussed in detail in previous presentations in this series and are available for you to review on the Fire Risk Management Group portal. Personal, personal emergency evacuation plans. This is a plan for a person who may need assistance or a person with impaired mobility to evacuate a building or reach a place of safety in the event of an emergency. When someone is identified in your fire risk assessment as needing their own escape plan, you need a people. That may be someone with mobility, sight, hearing, or cognitive impairment. It could be someone with a medical condition or an injury, which might cause them to need assistance to evacuate safely. Note, the person in charge, competent person, is required to provide a written plan for that person's specific requirements in the event of an emergency stroke evacuation. PEEP supply to full and part-time staff, the public and visitors. There is a two-plan approach to PEEPs. Plan A, off-site, where practical, hold a meeting with disabled, <coughs> excuse me, disabled visitors in a ground floor meeting room, the zero harm solution, or off-site, for example, in a local hotel, a conference center, etc. However, this option is not reasonably practical, but it is low cost option, maintains credibility for the organization and transfers the risk. Plan B, assisted evacuation. A practical solution may be a generic PEEP and is suitable where you have staff with temporary mobility issues or short-term visitors of less than two weeks duration on the premises. You also have an individual PEEP. This is for an employee who is physically, mentally, or visually impaired and any disabled long-term visitors where they will be on the premises for greater than two weeks duration. There is no plan C. BS 8300-2009 plus A1 2010, shown on the left of the slide, design of buildings and their approaches 
to meet the needs of disabled people, promotes good practice design principles to ensure new buildings and their approaches can meet the needs of disabled people and are convenient to use. Please note, a PEEP is a contractual agreement and it requires communication, commitment and cooperation by everyone to work properly. The private rented sector is an important part of our housing market and it is the second largest tenancy in England. This sector has almost doubled in size over the last decade and now has 4.5 million households, which equates to about 20% of all households. At present, private rented sector properties have fewer working alarms installed than any other types of housing tenures. The smoke and carbon monoxide alarms England Regulations 2015 came into force in England on the 1st of October 2015. Local authorities can impose a fine of up to £5,000 if a landlord fails to comply with any remedial notices they serve. The regulations apply to any tenancy, lease or license of residential premises in England that gives somebody the right to occupy all or part of a premises as their only or main residence in return for rent. The regulations do not apply to social housing landlords. In certain circumstances, properties may be exempt from the regulations. These are the ones in which amenities such as a toilet, personal washing facilities, a kitchen or a living room are shared between the tenants and the landlord or members of the landlord's family. Others which are excluded include the following. Tenancies on a long lease, granting rights of occupation for seven years or more. Social housing owned by landlords who are registered providers. Students' halls of residence, hostels, care homes, hospitals, any accommodation relating to healthcare provision. The landlord must install at least one smoke alarm on every story of the rental property that is used as living accommodation. A carbon monoxide alarm must be installed in any room used as living accommodation where solid fuel is used. Solid fuel comprises of coal and wood, wood burning stoves and fires. The landlord must ensure that alarms are installed in their properties are in good working order at the start of each new tenancy. After the landlord's tests on the first day of tenancy, the tenant should take responsibility to test all alarms on a regular basis to ensure that each unit is working. We're advised to test alarms monthly. In addition to smoke detectors and alarms, Landlords are legally required to fit carbon monoxide detection alarms in their properties under the Smoke and Carbon Monoxide Alarm England Regulations 2015, as mentioned, and also under the Building Regulations 2010, Approved Document B, J 2.34-36, L, etc. And also the British Standards BS 5839-6 2019, the fire detection and fire alarm systems for buildings. <clears throat> now let's look at the Fire Safety Act 2021. As mentioned, the report of the findings of phase one of the Grenfell Tower inquiry was published on the 30th of October, 2019. <clears throat> Two significant pieces of new legislation have followed. Fire Safety Bill, which responds to the Public Inquiry Phase 1 report by clarifying the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order 2005. The Building Safety Bill, which responds to the Hackett Review of Building Regulations and Fire Safety. This will implement all of the recommendations made in that review in respect of high-rise residential buildings. The Fire Safety Bill was introduced in March 2020 was made law on the 29th of April 2021 and has become the Fire Safety Act 2021. 
The changes mostly apply to multi-occupied residential buildings, any premises that comprise of anything other than a single dwelling. For example, a house converted into two flats needs a fire risk assessment and adequate fire safety measures, as well as a high rise building with hundreds of apartments. A new paragraph makes it clear that the RRO 2005 applies when the premises is a building containing two or more sets of domestic premises. This removes the ambiguity in the current RRO 2005 around whether such parts are covered. The Fire Safety Act 2021 amends the RRO to clarify that the responsible person or duty holder for multi-occupied residential buildings must manage and reduce the risks of fire for the structure and external walls of the building and includes cladding, insulation, fixing, balconies and windows. Also, entrance doors to the individual flats that open into common parts to ensure that the entrance doors to the individual flats that open into the communal areas are fully compliant and maintained. The appropriate fire rated doors will need to have all fire rated hardware, the correct insulation strips, and be documented in the fire risk assessment. Currently, there is unclear requirements regarding the inspection and testing regime of door closers. Clarification is required. All multi-storey, multi-occupied buildings in England and Wales must have a fire risk assessment, which takes into account all the mentioned areas of the building via an FRAEW, that's a fire risk assessment appraisal for external walls. The Act also empowers the fire and rescue services to take enforcement action and hold building owners to account if they are not compliant. So by ensuring you have carried out a fire risk assessment, not only will it ensure you're doing everything practically possible to prevent and protect against fire in the first place, it may also be your best defense should an incident occur to prove those actions in court. The Building Safety Bill. The objective is to strengthen the whole regulatory system for building safety by establishing a comprehensive new building safety regime governing the design of construction and occupation of high rise buildings. This will be achieved by ensuring there is greater accountability and responsibility of the design and construction of the building and thereafter through the life cycle of the building. Following Royal Assent, the government intends that a number of changes will come into force within the first 12 months. Today, I will briefly mention the building safety regulator, the accountable person, and the building safety manager. If you haven't already read the text of both acts, best you do to get an understanding of what is in place and what is coming by the end of 2022. Note, the government will continue to work closely with the Building Safety Regulator, OPSS, and the wider sector to prepare, to prepare us all for the transition to the new regime. As both the Fire Safety Act and the Building Safety Bill are new and complex in some respects, it wouldn't be useful to try and summarize the, context, the contents here just in a few sentences. So best we revisit these topics at a later date and allocate the time they deserve. This will ensure we give a clear and constructive re review of the content and how their introduction will affect us all. Excluded from the definitions are residential care homes, secure residential accommodation, such as prisons or detention centers, and temporary accommodation such as hotels, hostels, guest houses, hospitals, and hospices. Initially, the proposed regime will apply to new buildings, but it is expected to apply to existing buildings in due course, although the detail is unclear. The Health and Safety Executive, the HSE, will be responsible for overseeing the safety and performance of all buildings. The Building Safety Regulator 
will oversee the new requirement, which is the implementation of a three-stage gateway with specific points at design, construction, and completion phases to ensure that safety is considered at each and every stage of a building's construction. The bill proposes a golden thread of information, which is a live digital document with accurate and up-to-date information of the building data around fire safety matters. Before one can pass through one gateway to the next, the building safety regulator will require evidence that the relevant standards have been satisfied. A building's assurance certificate will need to be obtained from the building safety regulator in respect of all high rise, of all high risk buildings in occupation, whether existing or new, and the building will need to be registered. The building safety regulator will have power to prosecute of offenders under the bill and also under the Building Act 1984. Two new roles created under the Act are the Accountable Person, AP, and the Building Safety Manager, BSM. Both these positions have long lists of duties and responsibilities. And as you read down through them, you'll find the devil is in the detail. This is another long list of duties. And the role of the Building Safety Manager, the BSM, is confirmed in the Building Safety Bill. The AP must be satisfied that where the BSM is a person, it can also be an organization, that they have the skill, knowledge, experience, and behaviors to carry out the functions of a Building Safety Manager. Where the Building Safety Manager is an organization, it must appoint an individual acting under its control to be the nominated individual for the building and must be satisfied the individual has the same qualities as an individual building safety manager. The duties outlined in the slide are many and PASS 8673 specifies the requirements for building safety competence relevant to the role, the function, and task of the building safety manager based on the core requirements and core competencies set out in BSI Flex 8670. To conclude this session today, I remind you that designing for fire safety D4FS is about design, sorry, not just about design, it's limited is to set squares and rulers or even just CDM. It starts with principle and golden rules. Design comprises all aspects of the way the building is constructed, facilitated, operated and maintained. Design includes fire risk management, fire safety management systems, fire risk assessments, all six tenets of the RRO, PEEPs, Fire Safety Act 2021 and the Building Safety Bill, which with its new roles, safety cases and golden threads. Design includes fire prevention, protection and precautions, fire safety engineering, good operations, process safety, safe storage, maintenance and ergonomics. And above all, Good design needs good people to operate a building or facility safely. And finally, don't forget, our last presentation in the current series is on Thursday, the 10th of March, 2022, at 12.30 hours GMT. That's principle six, taking advantage of current and future technological developments in fire safety and the presenter will be Ian Scott. Thank you all for your time this afternoon. Uh, back to you, Michelle, Ian, and Neil. Okay, and uh, stop sharing, Michael, please. Brilliant, lovely.
Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for a, I think what was a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, and clearly by the number of questions and things that's being received, um, that uh, we have a number, of the, there's a lot of questions being raised by it. So now we won't be able to cover all of these um, within the time we got left. Um, I'll try to cover as many as possible. And uh, we'll throw these questions open to, uh, to Michael and to Ian to actually answer. So the first question comes in from Damien. And this one uh, is uh, particularly, I think, important to you, Michael. He, he says, can, uh, can Michael comment on the proposed Irish code of practice for fire safety assessment, um, especially the, the issue of competency? Um, and also, can Michael recommend any courses for fire safety management? Well, maybe the, the last part of that's a bit difficult to do in the short time we have. But what about this new code of practice, Michael? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, so, sorry, this is a big point at the moment about uh, how competent people are to carry out fire risk assessments, etc. And there are many people in the industry, you've worked in the industry for many, many years, and they're finding uh, what some of the proposed recommendations are um, may not be in line with what they had in mind. However, um, as we talked uh, there a bit about what's happening in both the Fire Safety Act and the, uh, the Building Safety Bill, uh, it's important that people have the appropriate uh, training, education, um, the, the competencies, you know, being, uh, you, you know, if you've been out there and you talk the talk, you must walk the walk as well. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, coming down the road at us. And um, I'm sure that we would all agree that to have the uh, appropriate uh, qualifications, training, work experience, etc., cetera, um, will go a long way uh, to ensure that you have the competencies. However, there are many courses available. Um, IOSH uh, have courses and there are other places uh, uh, we, we talked about it ourselves here on the fire risk management group, but uh, in Ireland there's also places and many courses available. Um, uh, I know there's certainly one in Dublin City University where I work. Uh, there's other courses uh, around the country at other universities um, where people can gain the qualifications. But also, as I said earlier, you really need to go out and get the experience as well on site. Ian, I, I think you probably would like to add to that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And thank you very much indeed for a very interesting presentation. Unfortunately, I have no first-hand experience of the code of practice. Um, I haven't worked in, in Ireland for, for a while. But um, what I would say is, as you said at the very beginning, there's a world of difference between a hazard spotting exercise, looking at fire, fire hazards around the place, and actually completing a fire risk assessment and seeing it through to the occupier or the employer or whoever's in charge of the building or the facility and, and implementing it. I think also there is a harmonization now. We are all coming to the same place, to the same standard, as it were, in how this vital, vital work is, is undertaken. And as you illustrated literally, graphically at the beginning of the presentation from the, uh, the tragedies in, in Dublin and, and London as well, we're, we're having to do something to make sure we've got commonality between all those who practice in this in this field. And that's simply my comment on the matter. Thanks, guys. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's covered that pretty well, actually. Um, obviously, it's a case of keeping an eye open when, when these code of practices and things are actually out there and, uh, and you actually get through to reading them. But you talk about sort of various incidents, and Alan raises a really good question. He says, referring to the King's Cross underground fire, which of course is another very serious one that's happened in the past. He says, the complexity of the underground station and its high level of use um, were an important factor. He says, how frequently therefore should the design of the facility maintenance and the fire precautions, uh, how, should, how frequently should they actually be reviewed and, how, and carried out? So basically how often would you review those sides of it, the design and the power precautions. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking back at some things that have happened in my career. 
especially where you have a lot of heavy uh, footfall. Um, uh, and whether that's in a sort of um, a hall of residence or a restaurant or whatever, but King's Cross been an exceptional place. I mean, the footfall there is colossal. Um, and um, I worked very, very briefly for London Transport way, way back many years ago. Um, and they have a lot of very uh, experienced and dedicated people. However, um, we all know that um, if maintenance isn't carried out, um, and if people aren't vigilant on a day-to-day -day, uh, time scale, um, things unfortunately do happen and, and get out of control. The, uh, how often you, you, you'd review it, um, people would say you're reviewing it daily uh, because there's people out there inspecting all the time. There's people monitoring uh, fire safety systems. There's people carrying out maintenance uh, on a daily basis, especially in large complexes. Um, and a requirement is that uh, you, you, you re, uh, review um, and audit uh, your fire risk assessments at least annually. Um, if you'd like to uh, join into that, uh, Ian. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, King's Cross, what, what can you say? 35 years ago, um, in 1987, I think standards have changed enormously since then. And I think one, one simple point to add would be, I seem to recall, they used wooden escalators. Yeah. That was the standard, yeah. that's what they did. And tragically, the escalators hadn't been in receipt of deep maintenance, to use a sort of naval expression. Um, so you would really like to take the thing apart, have a look underneath, remove the debris, remove the combustible materials, and the muck and the, uh, well, hair, fluff, grease, dead skin cells, and every other bit of detritus that, that gets down there, that gets soaked in, in grease and combustible um, material. And of course, you know, discarded smoking materials were, were possibly the, the cause of this. Um, all I could say is things have changed enormously. I think a fire risk assessment done of the operation now would have to make recommendations to the, the people in control of the activity as to when it should be repeated or reviewed or revised or revisited. And you might also put in there some monitoring equipment, some electronics these days, which we have available, probably we didn't have in 1987, um, which could measure issues like surface temperatures and bearings and motors and such like, to actually add some technology to the um to safeguard the equipment that was that was being used i would have thought <clears throat> there must be and to put a number on it there must be an annual review of this the organization i think should hold maybe it's an ongoing thing maybe it looks at several aspects of it on a, a 12-month rolling cycle but you know whether they look at their documentation their training their um, provision of plant and equipment and its maintenance and materials. Um, maybe they look at one of these items every quarter of the year, but it's an ongoing thing as well. Um, and also making strategic decisions, for example, prohibiting smoking in the underground would have been a tremendous improvement in fire safety, even in the, the late 80s and 90s. Indeed, well, thank you for those thoughts on yeah. that. Um, Guys, I'm, I'm actually going to actually draw the questions to a halt now, but it is very nearly, in fact, I think it now is 1.30 in the UK. So we do come to the end of the webinar. Now, the questions are said, there are many questions. I think there's something like nearly 30 questions that's been asked. Um, answers to those will be available within the next sort of two to three weeks. Um, and they'll be available from the, the IOSH virus management website. So that therefore just leaves me the, uh, the nice task really to thank, thank Michael actually for the time and for the presentation um, that he's given us. I've seen some very nice comments going through on the, on the chat saying well done. So it's always good to see and thank you for that. Uh, thanks also to Michelle who's hiding behind the screens um, but she's been busy reviewing your questions and answers and things that's come through so and their support uh, as has Ian as well. And of course, thank you Ian for joining the, the questions and answers session as well. Yeah.
Um, also, can I thank Kim Paul, who works for IOSH, and she's behind the scenes looking after the technical side of things. So thank you to Dimple as well. So whatever you are, um, whoever you are, wherever you are in the world, um, you know, we hope you found that this webinar has actually fulfilled what we said we would set out to do. And it's been both interesting and informative to you. So final reminder, after once again, after our sixth um, webinar will be taking place on the 10th of March. I think this is going to be a really quite an interesting one for, for a lot of people uh, in the fact that it's looking at current sort of trends and, and sort of almost future technology. And Ian, who is on screen here at the moment, I feel he's, he's the person who will be giving that presentation. And he keeps telling me actually that almost every day something new crops up. That's how fast <laughs> this section is moving. So I think I would really sort of welcome and encourage you to join us on the 10th of March um, for that final session. So that just leaves me to say thank you to all of you um, who have actually joined us on this webinar today. Thank you for attending. Um, your continuing large numbers show that there's a real interest in the subject of fire and fire risk management that we're trying to cover in these webinars. So thank you and goodbye, and we'll see you in March. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.